Um, so I'm very pleased to be welcoming Edward Baer to Politics and Prose this evening um, to discuss his new book, The Food and Wine of France. The start of this book centers around one main question. As globaliz globalization influences many cultural traditions, um, has it had any negative effect on the renowned strengths of French cuisine? Responding to this concern, Bear explores French cooking region by region. In his exploration and research, Bear finds that, the f that, the, uh, f that French cheese, wine, and bread of today uh, never fail to meet his exacting standards. By detailing French cooking techniques, showing how French chefs are trained, and defining the unique blend of ingredients, methods, and the cultural je ne sais quoi that continues to mark the excellence of French culinary arts, um, uh, the eff negative effects of globalization uh, have not entirely diluted the art of French cooking. A review in the Wall Street Journal states, Edward Bear's the, the Food and Wine of France reminds us that there are still places in the world where good food comes from history and nature unimproved. Wild yeast spores, the organisms in the soil, salt from the sea, the coolness of limestone caves. If for no other reason, spend time with the Food and Wine of France to explore the cubby holes of history. Edward Bear's writing has been featured in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Forbes, and The Financial Times. He is the founder of the magazine The Art of Eating, and he is also the author of 50 Foods, A Guide to Deliciousness. Um, so please help me in welcoming Edward Bear to Politics and Prose. Thank you very much for all of you for showing up. Um, I don't always speak with a microphone, but I hope it, it works well. There's so much to say about French food, which I think is so that I almost don't know where to begin, but I think that's a sign of the wealth of French food. The first thing I was going to tell you is that I am of that generation, maybe one of the last of the, of the, the generations that grew up thinking that French food was the be all and end all of greatness in food. And I remember that my parents took us when I was probably 14 and something like 1964 to, to Europe, but especially to France. That's where they, they focused. And, and we ate, and it's hard because I wasn't really focused on food at the time, but certainly they thought the greatest food was in France, and we, and we did eat out. I don't remember any bad meals. I remember that my father, my parents were very abstemious, and my father once ordered, I can only remember once that he ordered a glass of wine, and it was red wine, and I think, and my, in my memory I tasted it, and it tasted to me just like vinegar. <laughs> and I have a feeling that they, they looked at him and saw a man who ordered one, uh, his wife ordered no wine, and his, he ordered one glass of red wine. I think it was probably the most abominable red wine. Um, we ended up in Paris. I don't remember how long the trip but lasted, but no more than two weeks. Uh, and my father was very careful with money, so that at the end he had something like $500 left over more than he had planned on spending. And I don't know where this came from, but I know that I lobbied very hard for spending it all at the Tour d'Argent. I know <laughs> that I did that, but I don't know where the knowledge came from, where that, 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 that came from. My father did not go to the Tour d'Argent. <laughs> I, I thought it for a moment I had it. Um, a, we went to some place must have been, uh, all I remember is the blue boar, so it must have been Le Sanglier Bleu or something <laughs> like that. And I think it had maybe one star. And, and for them, they spent a lot of money. And I do remember it was a really, really good meal. What, you know, the next thing I want to talk about is, is and, and it's something I talk about in the book, but maybe I don't even hit, hit it hard enough head on, is like, why is French food so great? Because as we know, it's 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 uh, its reputation has taken a bit of a downhill turn, and 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 people like uh, a chef I admire, like David Chang, but other people um, who certainly values French food. But these these are the people who are ascendant. You, you don't you don't look around New York, and you well I sh should say you do look around New York. You do see some French chefs with big names, Daniel Boulou, Eric Repère. But but the people who are, where the fun centers tend to be young and and not cooking French. So then you, I go back and I think, you know, well, what, where did this come from? And really, I'm talking about Western food. I would say that France is the greatest Western food. When I was little, we didn't we didn't qualify it, but but certainly there's no way to make an easy comparison with cultures that are really really different. And the first thing is that France is big, so it's rich. It's rich in economic terms, and it's varied. There are three kinds. Rough. Ver 
in speaking in very simple terms, the three kinds of French food. There's haute cuisine, there's the kind of cuisine bourgeoise that imitates it, that was originally cooked by, by professional cooks in homes and also by, by, by housewives, if that's what they should be called. Um, and then there's regional food. And when we talk about the, the large size of France, the hexagon, which it very crudely, th that's the way the French <coughs> refer to it, but it's, a, it's very crudely a, a hexagon. And you think about it, when I think about it, you know, you have, you have Burgundy, you have the ocean with its oysters and seafood and, and Normandy with its apples, and then you have the Pas de Calais, which is next to Belgium, and is kind of the drink is more beer than wine, and then you have the mountains against Switzerland to jump around, and you have Alsace, which is partly Germanic, and then you, you well, I don't know, just jumping around to Provence, and, and you have the Basque country. None of these local cuisines are particularly French. So I kind of rule them out of the equation when I talk about French food. What makes them French, perhaps, is that appreciation for, um, for, for th th the appreciation of the po importance of eating, that, that valuing of sensuality, perhaps, maybe it's pushing it a little far with regional cuisine, but the, but, but the appreciation for voluptuousness in food. Uh, but I kind of rule them out of the equation of what makes up French food. There, there are three things, and, 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 and I would say, I'm losing myself a little in my, my many thoughts. The cuisine bourgeoise is really one of, is, is the cuisine influenced by haute cuisine. It's, 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 an, it, it's uh, it uses similar techniques, it uses similar ingredients, but with, with less luxury, less labor, less professionalism, less uh, refinement. So what makes French food French? And I think there are three hugely important things, one of which, um, th three, three hugely important things, all of which are fermented. Uh, one of them is bread, um, the other is cheese, and the last is wine. And bread is important because it's a, it's, it's a terrific complement to food. France is also, for reasons that I am not able to explain, but it's the greatest country in the world for wheat and wheat bread. Greatest country in the world for wheat bread. Let's just zero right in. Cheese is important because it's so varied, which is back to the, the, the variety in the hexagon, and because when it's really good, it's great. So is bread, but, but cheese is a more complex food. And then the last, of course, is wine, which is both varied in France, not always great, as my father found out, um, but sometimes really, really great. And one of the things that the cheese and the wine do is they set a high standard. The, re the cooking has to measure up. You can't have things that are that good, when, and especially when you're talking about everything focusing, the wealth focusing on Paris and, and originally the aristocracy, where, where luxury was um, a way of being. Uh, you can't have things that are as good as that cheese and especially that wine without having the, the food have to measure up. At the same time, there were other things that were really important from the seven, well, the, the, the famous markets that were the belly of Paris, the Al, date from the, the 1100s, and the first uh, physical building called an Al was built in something like, I think the book, the date is in the book, but something like 1170 something. So this, the, 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 venera the, the importance of markets and vegetables and, and meats, all the materials is old. The, the, the luxury fruits and vegetables date really from the 1700s, which is also the, the same time, by no coincidence, that modern French cooking, as opposed to medieval spicy cooking, modern French cooking comes into being. So you have that. But the thing about wine, wine to me dictates the, the, the thing which is most important about French food, perhaps most defining. So the wine is dry because you, 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 there are ways of controlling it, but basically it ferments and all the sugar is gone and it's dry. There is sweet wine. But uh, great dry wine is ruined by sweet food. So that already segregates sweetness to dessert. And you begin to have, in the 1700s, with this modern kind of cooking, you begin to have uh, a structure, and the struct a, me a structure of a menu, not everything arriving at once. Um, to some extent, yes, but, uh, but in previously, everything arri ro ro arrived at once, and it, it, uh, the, the meal essentially had no shape. Uh, but the wines, build in nature. You have more delicate wines, you have heavier wines, less alcoholic wines, more alcoholic wines, wines that are lighter, wines that are heavy in body, so the, and, and intensity of flavor. So the wines, you want to serve one wine to complement the other, you're, you, you have a build. At the same time, the wine should relate to the food. So the dishes have to build. So the dishes are relating to one another. The wines are relating to one another. There should be no repetition. There should be an elements 
if you can, in the realm of talking haute cuisine, luxury foods, continuing elements of surprise from one course to another. You're not, re not only are you not repeating sauces, depending on how big the meal is, that is, you don't have two cream sauces, um, you, may, you may try to avoid repeating sauces at all, depending on how big the meal is. So you have this interaction of food with food, wine with wine, and eat all along the way, wine with food. And that gives the structure of a, of a French meal. And there is no other culture that produced that kind of structure of a meal always with the stress on sensuality. And that also relates to something like, like why is French the greatest country for wheat, France the greatest country for wheat, I can't say. But it, it relates to this analytical nature of, of, of the way French think. And I would find this, you know, you, you ask uh, an artisan, a winemaker, you ask a question, and it might be me, the impulsive American, coming in and asking a question that isn't quite clear, logical, fully thought through, and they will pause, and they will think, and you just know this is the way you were taught in school. And, and, and they give this very ordered answer that you just can't poke holes in. And that clearly is related, in my mind, to, to, the, to the structure of, of a meal, to a menu, which is so distinctively French. Nonetheless, <laughs> for all this structure and order that I've just sketched out, the people who are making the food, the, the bakers, the winemakers, um, they're often real. I mean, the chefs can be big egotistical people for sure, especially modern times. They're stars. They're they're wealthy. They're businessmen. They're businesswomen. Um, the guy, the the people doing the the work, the bakers. The bakers, the cheese makers, the farmers, um, I think I'm going to read you something about a vinegar maker. These people can be so humble and um, what they do doesn't involve necessarily a lot of intellect. Maybe with a, uh, a, a winemaker much more so, uh, sometimes a cheese maker, but, but, and you have to do everything well, you have to be organized, you have to measure. But, but for instance, for the fermentation of bread, the, to me the most important thing is that, that the baker can feel the state of the dough in his fingers. And that's just, that's it. That's the whole, to me, the whole thing. Yes, you have to have the right proportions of water. You have to have great, good to great flour. You have to measure the salt right. You have to do everything. But it's that state of fermentation. And it's, it's completely not intellectual. It's just completely intuitive. So there's this, this, this balance of, of um, of, of intellect and sensuality. I'm going to I'm going to read you just this 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 little bit. It's not a this is not a, a reading, but it's it's a little bit of a reading. So I went long a long time. Uh, the, the great center of vinegar in France is Orléans because the wine came down the river, and it was it uh, it stopped in Orléans and they checked it and to see how many barrels were vinegar basically. <laughs> And the lesser barrels were turned into vinegar, and that's where that uh, we think of Dijon mustard. But there were all the all the mustard makers were there too. There were some in Dijon, obviously, but the mustard makers were there because they used the, they they used vinegar. Um, and so there was one guy. Left. There's a big thing about Orleans processed vinegar, and and people talk about it as if pe people who are fanatical about vinegar talk about it as if it were special. It's really just making vinegar in barrels, and. There was one guy, and still is left, in Orléans making vinegar at all, I think, unless somebody's just started up again. But he was also the only one left continuously making vinegar, in, only one left in France, continuously making vinegar in barrels. And he's right on the edge of, of, of the downtown. And his name is, it's a double name, and I'm not going to forget. It's, he, uh, the, the, the brand is Martin Pouré, and I'm forgetting his name, Jean-François Martin. So it was like his great-grandfather or something who started the vinegar. So just, just to give you a sense. The vinegar barrels, the vaisseau vinegar barrels, lay on their sides and looked a lot like regular wine barrels. The average one at Martin Pouret was 30 years old, and some were 80. Many were banded by wooden rather than metal hoops. From the end of each, an L-shaped glass tube protruded to show the level of the liquid inside. Above the tube, a round hole several inches across let in air. Seeing that the opening was uncovered, I asked Martin whether vinegar flies, which are the same as fruit flies, were a problem. He paused as if I'd posed a riddle. Yes, we have them, he said, and no, they are not a problem. 
<laughs> a few flies circled near the vaisseau, but not as many as you might see around a bowl of ripe fruit in summer. Maybe, I thought, the pungency repelled them. The vaisseau are kept about 60% full. No one measures, and Mart Martin gave this estimate reluctantly as if for the first time. The liquid inside is covered by a fine veil of bacteria, not the thick, gelatinous mother that often appears on vinegar when you make it at home. Martin Pouret's steady supply of new wine makes the bacteria too lively for that. Every three weeks, a quarter of the vinegar is drawn off, leaving the barrels about half full, and the same amount of wine is added back. The vaso are never cleaned or even rinsed. After the acetic fermentation, the vinegar is aged in great casks for six months so that aromas can develop, as with wine, Martin said. I asked him about the advantages of using wood, whether it breathed, for instance. Yes, he seemed to say, commenting. If you put vinegar in something that is dead, that is inert. But the essence of his response was to explain that the company has do does what is it has always done. Donc, ça marche bien. Therefore, it goes well. These are very American questions, Martin said. There is a certain tradition, and if one wants to continue it, one must repeat the old process. It's like the rest of gastronomy. It was so obvious to him that he almost shrugged. So I feel that what I should comment on is what happened to French food, which is not always, not perhaps the easiest thing, and, and yet, um, I don't know, maybe the answers are obvious. I mean, we're, we have lived, well, let me step back because I tend sometimes to assume information that people may not have. But the last really energetic moment for French food was Nouvelle Cuisine in the 1970s, which gradually petered out in the 80s. And after that, there were some famous French chefs that people may have heard of, such as Joël Robuchon and Pierre Garnier. Um, but the, the, there wasn't that force. There wasn't, there wasn't the energy. There wasn't the, the, the international influence. And, then you, and, and, and everybody always wants to know why. And now there is again a little energy. But what happened? Um, I th to me, and, and these are just, these are my thoughts. But I think people, people's attention spans grew shorter and shorter. And, and France had been the center of, of food attention for two centuries, let's say. I'm not sure when it became just kind of internationally dominant. It was the international cuisine. It was the cuisine you had in hotels where, where, wherever you traveled, if, if it was a kind of a modern hotel, certainly in North America, too, and, and in Anglophone, other Anglophone countries. And so people began to look eventually to Asia and do wild and crazy things. And, and France wasn't moving. And you ask, I, I asked my friend uh, Benedict Boger, who's cited in the book, but this is, I think, not in the book. But I said to him, you know, you know, is it is it is it coming back? Because I, I think I think it's got so much force, so much power. There's such a wealth of, of dishes, of raw materials, of cheeses, of wines, of techniques, uh, just of the, of the sense of the lo of the sense of the logic of a meal that we're, I was talking about with Emmanuel. It's like it's got to come back. And Benedict described almost a trap. He's um, I should back up and tell you he's a. Uh, uh, he's not well known even in France, but he's probably the smartest person writing critically about food in France. And has, he's done a number of books. Um, and he, what, he, what, he, what he said was, that basically he described a trap, that, that the French know they've got this thing of unbelievable value. And here I'm talking about chefs and, and artisans, but, but, and winemakers and, other, and others, people really involved with food. And they're so proud. And, and, and they don't understand why the world isn't celebrating it the way they do. And they don't have the American style ego to go out and present themselves. And they just, that, that's, the, that's their trap. They can't get behind past it. I, I, I can't contradict Benedict. I, I'm, I'm sure it's that, that's probably as, as fair as, as anyone else's um, analysis. But there's an, uh, at the same time, there's, to, in, in my mind, I, I, I think I'm right, Th this continuing incredibly powerful influence that people are not so aware of. Um, you probably all know that food is in. <laughs> and, and restaurants are now filled with young people compared with the way they used to be. And restaurants don't have tablecloths so much anymore. They have, there's, there's this whole realm of, of uh, what a, a chef 
in Boston once first referred to, and I thought it was just very perfect. I think he said the economy luxury restaurants. He may have said luxury economy restaurants, but the idea is that you take um, the great techniques and, and the great materials, but maybe not the most luxurious, expensive ones. Um, and so everything coming from the kitchen is that it, it aspires to the haute cuisine level. But everything in the di dining room is about economy because you've gotten you've, you've you've found cheap rent. You've gotten rid of uh, some of the assertive staff. You've gotten rid of the laundry, the cost of laundry from tablecloths and 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 probably napkins. Um, trying trying to trying to think of other things, but there are other uh, you're turning tables. That's the most important thing, which they never used to do in France and still don't always. But if you called uh, for a table, and it, it can be so civilized, you know, it can be six o'clock. I believe this is still as true as it ever was. Six o'clock, and you call a small restaurant. The chef and the, everybody is completely prepared, and they're relaxed. And it's very likely the chef who answers the phone, and um, and and will take your reservation because it's not so stressed out. Depending now, well, now in Paris, maybe not so likely to happen. But you can you can get a table because people don't. <laughs> People like my friend Benedict, older French, they're just in Paris, they're just appalled by the idea that you have to reserve even two weeks ahead. Um, and they take your reservation, and now I'm getting lost in my thought because I got, got sidetracked in my anecdote. Um, so so I'll, I'll jump back, hoping, hoping, hoping to, 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 to regain my train of thought. So, so this whole genre uh, of, of luxury economy restaurant also started in France, and it is, I think there's a direct link, and it's the do now the dominant kind of, of uh, uh, genre of restaurant that there is in, in uh, certainly in in North America. I think I think through much of the Western world. So there is this influence there. It's just not so obviously French. I'm going to check the time to see what I'm how I'm doing. Um, I think I should open it up for questions because I can I can talk. You you can send me down a path that uh, maybe I've I've just crossed the beginning of. Are there questions? Yes. yes, a question. Uh, I'm sort of an old person. I imagine I cook like everybody here. We love food. When I lived in Paris in the 50s and 60s, people talked about la gamme des goûts. Mm -hmm. And you did a slight reference to that when you said sweets at the end. There's never mm -hmm. anything sweet in the beginning, you know. The idea of having mint jelly with your <laughs> meat. No, no, no. Can, can you see if, if the log that logic still holds? Uh, well, the Overall, I think it does still hold. We have to. We ca we can bear in mind that, fr there, that 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 French food isn't absolutely rigid because the, um, the duck duck à l'orange or canard à l'orange, yeah, which comes from uh, canard à la bigarade, is is a, a rem. There are a very few remnants of the sweet and sour taste of the Middle Ages, which are almost always fruit. So it's duck with cherries, duck with preferably sour orange. Um, from uh, Tours, it's it's pork with prunes, and there are a few other examples, but not many. So there are. The, it was never absolute, but it's um, it's not so much that you can't find a wine to match as as, as a rule. But it might it, if it's if it's pushed, it could be a little except it, it could be a little exceptional. But but pork with prunes would go with a Bouvray from Tours, for instance, which would have an edge of sweetness. Is that still is it still so rigid? There have certainly been some. Um, been some move more towards sweet and sour kinds of things, but I think it, I think overall I think that still pretty much holds. That 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 we se that the French segregate their their sweet and savory. And you eat the French way, remaining slim, never entre les repas. Right? No, <laughs> I I my wife says that I'm just a nervous person. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm a fidgeter, but I I I, I have um, I've eaten pastry today, so. <laughs> Anybody else? <coughs> I've stunned you into silence. Yes. Oh, you should speak at the microphone if you can. Since we've just gone through Brexit, um, apparently one of the resentments that some of the English people had uh, had to do with dictates that were coming from Brussels that affected their regional foods. Um, is France experiencing the same thing and has resentment built a, a, about it? That's a, a, a really good question. This, for, I mean, this predates, predates a little bit 
the EU, because I, I remember visiting a baker lost in the countryside of the south of France, and he he was telling me, and this is in uh, you know a, uh, a in the countryside where culture holds strong. There that was Occitan speaking, um, and he was. He, he, he was trying to expand his bakery, and he had to go to a complex meeting with bankers and all kinds of people. Basically, everybody had their fingers so surely on it that basically he, he couldn't do anything innovative, but he also couldn't lose money because nobody was going to take a chance. So there would be a, a, one, one example of that kind of thing. The usual example that's cited is in wine, where, where the Appalachians control the, the grapes you, you plant, and there's been a, lot of, there's been a certain amount of pushback. Um, I don't think the French look to the EU as the culprit. I think they look mainly to their own government because this predates the EU. It's, it, it, it's cuts both ways because, you know, if you have a, a well-defined wine, a well-defined cheese, it helps you sell it. It's, it's a, I mean, the Appalachian system is, is essentially a marketing tool. However, if it means you can't innovate, it's frustrating, and, and I can say, because I've been doing a lot of detailed writing about cheese recently, that the Appalachians change sometimes. The cheeses evolve a little bit, and the rules flex to allow it. Also, the cheeses weren't so, de weren't so defined originally. I mean, going back to the 19th century or to whenever, you know, well into the 20th century, up, up to the Second World War and, and, and even after. And, and it was in the aftermath of the Second World War that modernization put an end to so many things or, or, or diminished their quantity. Uh, then the, before that, the cheese, a, a single cheese might be, much, um, might be much more varied, always going under that name. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a little variation, but you know, they, some cheese, the, the same cheese might, might be sold as banon, wrapped in leaves, unwrapped in leaves, wrapped in different kinds of leaves, aged, first, aged in a certain way, n aged very little. Uh, and, and the Appalachian has it all, all defined. It's all the banon. It's always wrapped in leaves. It's always aged for uh, at least five days before it's put in leaves, and then it's, it has to be aged for a mandatory, I don't know, 10 days after that. Um, but in the past, it was almost inevitably much, much older. Anyway, the, it's, um, so the short answer is there's some resentment aimed at the EU, but I think this is a much older problem in France, and it has very much to do with that analytical tendency that I talked about, I think. Yes? I haven't had the pleasure of reading your book yet, but um, you seem to be more optimistic about globalization and French cuisine than I would have suspected, because um, those of us who've uh, been in France in recent years are very impressed by les grands surfaces, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the French mm -hmm. have really taken the supermarket to a <laughs> new level. C'est uh, un hypermarché. Yes, the hypermarché. <laughs> and they, they've exported it. If yeah, you go yeah. to Beijing or Malaysia or wherever, yeah. there are French hypermarchés. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, is that uh, phenomenon, um, the business model, is that um, okay with you as far as the <laughs> maintaining the traditions of these fine cheeses and wine and so forth? Because uh, when you go to the hypermarché, there are about five aisles of cheese, right? Yeah, yeah. Six aisles of <laughs> wine. Uh, <laughs> but is the quality there for the future? N not necessarily. So, I mean, it's, it's variable. You know, I probably, probably just talking today, I, I somehow stressed, um, stressed the positive, and, and I, 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 I didn't mean to do that too much. I think what has happened, not to sp speak directly to the supermarket phenomenon, but what has happened is that the strength of French food is now in the hands of a very small number of people who would be um, more, who, who would tilt toward winemakers in terms of sheer numbers, um, but cheese makers to some extent, bread makers, charcutier, um, you know, the, the rare traditional good, really good mustard maker. I mean, there, there's been an enormous retreat and, and, and uh, Industrialization and and collapsing into into of, of old firms into fewer modern firms, um, but I think that what they have conserved is still very very strong. I think we're dealing with um, you know, residue is way is, is 
too negative. But we're in terms of, all right, if you have a product, if you, ha if you, if, if you have a dish, it can't just exist in isolation. If a chef, if me, you know, kid growing up in Chevy Chase, which I did, um, if, if, if you read in a, in a cookbook how to make a dish and, and you think you've got it and you execute it, it's not the same as, as, if, as if you grow up in a village or an area where everybody cooks that dish and there's a, there's, a, there's a local culture, there's a body of knowledge about what defines that dish and how it's made and how it should taste. So what we're losing is that, that aspect of, of French culinary culture because fewer and fewer people are cooking at home, so you don't have, if you want, um, I don't know, um, a cassoulet from, from Castelnaudry. Um, if, if not enough people are making that cassoulet, we'll, the, the, the sense of what that should taste like is, go, is going to be lost, and that's, that, that's, that's huge. It's not all gone yet by any means, but, but that, that's, that's the thing that will, I think will continue to fade. So, and, and then this, this, the supermarkets, they've, they've co-opted a lot of good food, and people don't want to, to shop every day in little um, street markets or whatever, if, assuming, well, in Paris you could do that, but, but not everywhere you can because there's only a weekly market, but it's so much easier to go to the supermarket. And you can buy, um, you know, a farm-raised chicken that just is stunningly better than anything I'm aware of that even, you know, our best farmers market type farmers are doing in this country. So it, it's the, the, the hypermarché are a, a mixed quantity. But good question. <laughs> Keep me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> so here we're suffering from rules that protect us, pasteurized milk. Is that happening in France too, where everything has yeah, to be pasteurized? Yeah, there's been there has definitely been a, a, a loss and a fear. I mean, this is a, a funny a funny example. Maybe it's a pastry example, but to me. Um, an éclair or any kind of um, puff pastry, a pâte à choux thing, uh, uh, a profiterole filled with ice cream. The whole thing, well, a profiterole is almost the best example of it. That needs to be made at the last minute, um, and it needs to be filled at the last minute, just before serving, so it's crisp, so you have the contrast of texture. If you take fresh bread, as I learned long, one time years ago, I, I used to bake bre all my bread for about 10 years. I took this beautiful loaf, and we had a back pantry, and it was fall, and I wasn't thinking. And I took it and put it in the ba set it in the back pantry to cool, and it was cold, and the freshness was gone immediately. Real cold just destroys freshness. So you take your, your, your patachou shape, whatever it is, and then you fill it and you put it in your refrigerator, it loses all its texture, it loses all its fresh baked flavor, it loses its reason for being. So essentially, in France, that's extinct because it's required by law. You cannot get a good éclair in France. Um, but you can't get one here either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think of Italy, but you know, it, it's not unique. Um, you know, a, a cannolo in, in, in Sicily should be fried in lard to order and filled to order too, and not so sugary sweet. But anyway, that's we're filled with fresh ricotta, preferably sweetened a little bit. But so it's, it's, it, it, it's a wonderful concept of, of something that's freshly baked and has that, 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 that creamy, cool contrast, but alas, it's, um, it's, it's under threat from the bureaucrats. However, we can, um, in Vermont and, and next door in New Hampshire, um, we can get, uh, the, the state allows us to get raw milk at the farm, so you can get, you can even get raw cream, which is a whole nother world. <laughs> and raw cream butter, because they, they don't have, they don't have, I mean, the whole difference is, is the, they, the cooked dairy products have a caramel taste instead of a, a taste which is very subtly floury. Or you can come up to me afterwards. <laughs> How are we doing on time? I can read, an, I can read another thing. <laughs> I hardly know where to begin. There are too many options. The other thing about the vinegar place was it was so intense with acetic acid, as the chapter opens, the part I didn't read, that I found it hard to breathe. And, and this guy, Jean-Francois Martin, it was like normal to him. And I actually crouched down on the floor like this to try and get some fresher air. And then vinegar fell on my head, and it was like, oh my god. <laughs> um, 
gosh, I hardly know where to begin. But um, this just um, the book is is very romantic, and and I, I was saying this to somebody, and they thought that was negative, like I was romanticizing. I think it's just it's romantic in the good sense. So Colte is one of the great cheeses, and I think. Um, one of the things I'm most drawn to write about is mountain cheeses. I just, it speaks to me. Uh, and this is the chapter, uh, Conte, H High Pastures, Joint Efforts, and a Big Mountain Cheese. Cyril and Florent Rabe milk 45 Montbéliard cows at their farm at the edge of the village of La Bergemont Sainte Marie in the Jura Mountains, not far from the Swiss border. The red and white breed is as much a part of the landscape of the Franche Comté as its pastures, forests, and broad farmhouses. The Rob farm lies at 950 meters, 3,100 feet, but you don't sense the altitude because you don't see peaks and bare rocks. The cows wear bells, although with fenced pastures, the, cow the sound is no longer needed to locate a cow. It's for the folklore, Florent said. From the window of my hotel room in the village of Jougne, at night when the traffic on the narrow road to the border had ceased, the sound of bells came from two different hillsides in a soft jangle, almost like breaking glass. On some farms, Florence explained, the cows wear a computer medallion, read automatically in the barn, so the cow re receives an individualized ration of grain. A bell would only get in the way. Early on a July morning, the two brothers worked the double line of cows, Florent Rob in coveralls and a visored cap, and his younger brother Cyril in jeans and bareheaded. They wore tall rubber boots and one-legged stools hung behind them from their belts, ready to fall into place as they sat beside each cow to clean her teats and attach the milking machine. The cows were busy eating grain, but three quarters of their food is pasture and hay. The Rob's milk goes to the village's small cooperative to make, be made into wide wheels of nutty, buttery Comté, one of the great cheeses. The name used to be Gruyère de Comté, but has, it has been simplified to Comté to distinguish it from the Gruyère made in Switzerland and the small amount of lesser plain Gruyère produced in France. Comté is France's most popular cheese with an appellation d'origine protégée protected designation of origin, and production has been steadily increasing. There's only a third as much Roquefort, the number two. Comté is outstanding for eating, and it is the essential French cheese for cooking. Nothing is better for an omelet or a souffle. Especially around Christmas time in France, it's a popular indulgence to serve vieux Comté from wheels as old as 24 and even 30 months. It flavor, its flavor has turned particularly nutty, toasted, and caramel, gaining a little of the character of Parmigiano. I could go on and on. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. I guess we'll do a little signing. <laughs>